Last week, uh, our daughter Ivana turned one year and one month. And last week, I noticed certain thing, uh, certain uh, changes in her. She was, a, uh, she was acting like a little baby. And last week, I noticed that at times she holds our head with both of her hands and draw it near to us, and uh, draw it near to her face. And gently and repeatedly say, Umma. An expression of love. Uh, whenever she does that, imagine the excitement that the parents get. She's telling uh, dad and mom, Dada, I love you, or Mama, I love you. An expression of love, in the way she communicates that love. The moments with the parents. The closer moments with our God, it has an effect on us. As we move forward with this sermon series in First Corinthians, this intimate moment with our God is a moment of communication in which God is communicating to us and we are communicating to Him. A moment in which God is telling us, Son, this is what is right. A moment in which we are responding to God. God, we love you. Let me entitle today's sermon as God and us. And shall we turn our attention to the second half of the sixth chapter of First Corinthians? Let me just skip the reading of the passage. I want to point out three major points of communication. Firstly, God values us. One of the major lessons that the Apostle Paul was presenting to the Corinthian believers through this message, through this letter is that God values you and I. Look at verse 20. For you are brought with a price. You were bought with a price. Because God values you. God redeems you. Therefore, he bought us from the slave block. Since he values you and I, he bought us with a price. A man was traveling in Paris and he purchased some inexpensive necklace from a small shop. Upon returning, back to United States after his trip. He took this necklace to a jeweler. This salesman, this, this shopkeeper, he looked through this necklace with his magnifying glass. He said, I will give you $2,500, no, $25,000 for this necklace. There was a price into this man because he paid very little money to buy that inexpensive necklace. Then he, he was wondering what is going on. So he went to another shopkeeper, another salesperson. And this man said, I will give you $35,000 for this. And this man asked, what do you see as valuable in this necklace? And he said, look through this glass. And he saw an inscription written there to Josephine from Napoleon. And that inscription, it made the necklace valuable. In the sight of God, you and I are valuable as the crown of his creation. He found us valuable. He found a worth in the humankind. And that is why he paid a price and bore you and I. What price did he pay? First Peter 1, 18 to 19. He says, we are bought not with any perishable things such as silver or gold. But we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. It cost something to God. Now what Paul presents through this lesson is that 
since you and I have been purchased by God, our life is no longer ours. Our body is no longer ours. We belong to God. More practically, what he says is that when you and I decide to do something with our bodies, understand or remember, we belong to God. When you and I decide to put something on our body or something in your body, remember, we belong to God. Imagine of renting a rental car. The rental people will look into everything related to that car and make sure that everything is same in the, in the manner that he gave it or he rent it. He makes sure that we didn't misuse that car for a single gallon of gas that is not in the car. They will charge us because that car belonged to them and they have an authority over that. You and I belong to God and God has an authority over us and we have to have that feeling that we belong to God. In the ancient Greek, In those times, in the Greek world, human body was considered to be an encumbrance to overcome. In the Greek worldview, what always matters is the soul. Body doesn't have any significance at all. Greeks always considered body to be irrelevant to anything significant. Greek sage and stoic philosopher Epictetus said, I am a poor soul shackled in a corpse. There was a Greek proverb, the body is a tomb. According to the Greek philosophy, all attempts of human life should be for the salvation of the soul, not for the body. So these kinds of feelings and schools of thought and philosophies of the Greek and Wars, it came to the minds of the people of those times and they came up with two kinds of feelings. Some people argue that since body is a tomb, we need to do everything to deny the body. We need to do everything to deny its passions. Therefore, mortify the body. That was the cry of this group. And they tried to deny themselves with food, deny themselves of food and pleasures. And there came another group of people who thought, well, since the body is unimportant, what is relevant is soul. We can do whatever we want to do with our bodies. Deny no pleasures. Now, in the Corinthian church, what happened is that a group of people who were influenced by the second type of thought to do anything with the body since the spirit or soul is the only thing that matters emerged in that church. And Paul was telling them, God, friends, God is not bothered about just your spirit and soul. He is also concerned about your body. He bought you and I. Look at verse 12 and 13. He says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant to be for the stomach and stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and, one and the other. What he says is that you must say that I am allowed to do anything. I have the freedom. But my reply is that not everything is good for you. You have the freedom to do anything. But be careful. Everything may not be good for you. Imagine of a skydiver sky who is going to 10,000 feet up in the air. And he is telling his rest of the group and telling them, I'm not going to use my parachute at this time. I want freedom. If, if a person says like that and then tries to enjoy his freedom, he will be dominated by another law, the law of gravity, and he has to suffer for that. 
There was a force that was able that enables him to land safely, but he denies that because he wants freedom. That's the same thing the apostle says. You guys have to be careful in your lives because if you try to enjoy freedom, there are chances that you may encounter a loss. Paul says, even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become slave to anything. Food is good, pleasure is good, but let them not dominate you. Paul addresses them and tells them, you say food is for stomach and stomach is for food. But I say our bodies were made for the Lord. The urge to eat is natural. The urge to have pleasures of this world is natural, but we should not forget the fact that we belong to God. We are made to be in union with God. Our purpose of life is not to enjoy the world, but to live in the world connected to God with the feeling that we belong to God. Good morning, friends. The word of God is telling us God values us. He bought us with a price and he wants us to live with a feeling that we belong to him. He wants us to live in this world with a feeling that our body belongs to him. He wants us to submit ourselves and our bodies pleasing him and worshiping him. God values us. The second thing that we see here is God dwells in us. Firstly, he says God values us. Secondly, he says God dwells in us. 6 verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy, Holy Spirit? A few weeks back when discussing from chapter 3, we have seen almost the same or a similar phrase. Church is presented as the temple of God or the temple of the Holy Spirit in that passage. If you look at the Old Testament, we see... God instructing Moses to build a tabernacle. He was given a clear cut view about the tabernacle that he was supposed to do. And he did that and it was a place of worship. A place where God resides and a place where the worship went up. When the temple of Solomon was built, we superseded the tabernacle. There also... The presence of God, the Shekinah, came down and there the people worship God. In the New Testament times, as a church, as a congregation, we are the temple of God. We exalt God. We praise God. We lift God up. We sing for Him. We worship Him. And the sweet aroma of this worship comes up to heaven, goes up to heaven, and God pleases in our worship. That's the truth. That's what we saw in words in, in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Now, the apostle was po is pointing out something else here in words in chapter 6. Where we have seen verse 19. He is asking, do, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? He was not telling about the church as a holy, uh, temple of Holy Ghost here. He is telling about individual people. Individual Christians. Our body. As the temple of the Holy Ghost. He was reminding them of that moment in which you and I were regenerated. Accepted Christ as our Savior. Where the Holy Spirit came into us. He was telling them friends. The moment in which you came to know Christ. The moment in which you accepted Christ as your Savior. That moment onwards. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Paul when telling to the Corinthians, they were familiar with small shrines and places of worship in those places. As we are people from India, we have seen people, especially in North India, where they have a separate room with all gods and goddesses, a place of worship, small shrines everywhere. That's the same thing the apostle says here, friends. You and I are small shrines of God where God's spirit resides. You and I are the place in which God resides. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The temple where God resides. No matter what kind of job you and I are doing. No matter where your cities you and I visit, visit it, Consciously or unconsciously. Understand this. God 
was or is with us. The Spirit of God is indwelling in us. We have the indwelling Spirit of God as a mark of God's ownership of our lives. We have the indwelling Spirit of God to help us to overcome the fleshly nature. We have the indwelling Spirit of God to intercede for us. We have the indwelling Spirit of God to renew us and help us to bear spiritual fruits. We have the indwelling Spirit of God and we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. What a great blessing that you and I enjoy. I remember the days in which we had one land for in all of our locality in Kerala, several years back. Who wants to call anybody in that locality, they have to call in that same number to one uh, uncle's one of person's house where they will come and tell us, oh, there's a message to you. Landlines were very, very rare during those days. And mobile phones or cell phones mm -hmm. were not at all evident. But now we have our cell phones with us. Wherever we go, we can call people. That's the same change happened earlier. God resides in one temple, but now God is within each and every one of us. Earlier, God was at one place in Jerusalem, but now we have Him in our hearts. We have Him in our body. We are carrying God all through our lives. The apostle is telling our friends, understand this. He is in us. He is residing in us. What a great privilege is that. It also points to a responsibility that you and I should never forget. Consider the tabernacle that Moses has erected in the wilderness. God was particular with one thing. You should keep it holy. Exodus 28, 43 says about that. Exodus 30, 20, it says they shall wash their hands, wash themselves with water, or purify themselves before they enter. The priest should wash themselves. Leviticus 10, 8 to 10 again says almost the same thing. A distinction should be there between the holy and common. A distinct distinction should be there between the unclean and the clean. The morning, that's the same challenge God is telling us. God is residing in us, therefore, you and I are supposed to be holy. God is residing in us, therefore, you and I are supposed to purify ourselves. This body, our life should be kept holy. Foreign unions are not coming into evidence here. Foreign unions are always an out of question here. If you are united with Christ, then you cannot do anything to taint that union. You can be a member of the United States Army and a Republican support or a Democratic support. You can be in the United States Army and be a part of any good organizations of this land. But you can be a part of the United States Army and at the same time a part of the Taliban. That would, that would be an incompatible union. Verse 12 of chapter 6 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all, not all things are beneficial. I want to explain with that with the example of iPad or a smartphone. We have iPhones and other Galaxy or all kinds of smartphones with us. And we have apps to run certain programs. These apps are enabling us to play or do certain things. And many of the apps are free. But though we are free to download everything, all apps may not be suitable for our instrument. I remember one time Jolie installed some app for the baby. And that moment itself, the speakers went down. The speakers shut off. That I was not compatible with that phone that she was using. That's the same thing the apostle is saying. There are a lot of things that you and I can do. We have the freedom to do everything. But there are certain things that are not compatible with the spirit of God who is residing in us. You might be free to do whatever you want to do in this 
world, but there are certain things that hurt the spirit of God. Some things are going to crash the system. Some things, certain things are going to crash the system. Certain things are going to hurt the spirit of God. Certain things are going to come make you halt the walk with God. Some things are not compatible with the spirit who dwells in you. It can crash your spiritual life. Some wrong relationship. Some wrong way of doing stuff. Some wrong attachment. Some wrong doing, some wrong preferences. It can crash your spiritual system, friends. Be careful. Sanctify yourselves. Second Corinthians 7 1. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The morning, the word of God is telling us, as people of God, who are carrying the spirit of God. Who are the temple of this holy ghost. We need to pursue sanctification. Pursue holiness. Coming back to the theme. Main theme. God and us. We have seen God values us. And God dwells in us. And now thoroughly God equips us. We have seen that God has brought us with a price. He started dwelling in us. And now understand that the spirit of God. It's not some dead weight that takes up the space in your life. The Spirit of God is a powerful force that can enable you to live your life for Jesus in the ways that would amaze you. You and I have access to one of the most powerful forces in this universe. The Spirit of God enables us to live in this world in accordance with God's plan. It is so easy to allow habits and practices and the ways of life to control and master us. But the Spirit of God provides us the strength to master everything that controls us. We are no longer enslaved to any of these appetites of the flesh or the instincts or the desires. As the recipients of the Holy Spirit, we are under His control. We are no longer slaves to flesh. Yes, God equips us to live in this world according to the pattern of the scripture. In 6 verse 14 of us Corinthians, another aspect is also mentioned. God raised us by his power. What Paul was saying is that the power of the Holy Ghost is not going to finish by the death of a believer it is going to continue till the resurrection of a man of God the Corinthian believers were kind of doubtful about the resurrection we see in the 15th chapter the apostle elaborately describing we will go and we will look to that in the later days but what he is saying is that friends remember you have the spirit of God in you and one day you might die or one day you will hear the trumpet call. On that day, since you have the Spirit of God in you, you will be transformed and you will go to heaven and be with the Lord. The Spirit of God is the ultimate power that enables the dead in Christ to be resurrected and the ones who are alive being taken into the skies when Jesus comes. The Holy Spirit that resides in us, He equips us to live in this world and move forward to the other world. Let me conclude my words here. Something that caught my attention in this book. That is repeated over and over again in this book. Is do you know this? Paul was asking them at least eight times. Don't you know this? Don't you not know? Again and again he asked, didn't anyone ever tell you this thing? Have you ever been informed? Don't you know that it's wrong to pit one preacher against another? Wrong to organize yourselves into cliques and be constantly at war with each other? He again asked, don't you know that such spirits of disrupting harmony is not right? He has again said, don't you know this? Don't you know that? A lot of things he asked. What he's saying is that, isn't it a new information? What I preach and what I said. Those things are not new things, but understand this. 
the spirit of god is reminding us again and again the reality that our fleshly body is valued by god is reminding us of the fact that we are brought with a price and there's a purpose with our lives that's a purpose with our body the purpose is glorify god in your body in verse 20 it says glorify god romans chapter 12 verse 1 to 2 it says offer your souls as living sacrifice offer your bodies to worship god refuse to be mastered by your body temple is the place to exalt god our culture is a culture that gives much importance to body we go to gym indulge your indulge ourselves with the fine food we have diet we have exercise we want to improve our body in various ways all these are good but the ultimate purpose for which you and i are called is to exalt god through our with our bodies our bodies are ought to be places of worship not objects of worship our bodies ought to be places of worship not objects of